I mean, look, Mike Elko is a smart hire. Mike Elko, there's a reason that Mike Elko was a top the targets list, not yeah. just for this job, but now reportedly Michigan State as well. Sounds like he may have been offered that job and turned it down. Mike Elko has been at Duke for two seasons, 16 and 9. He's gotten them to back-to-back bowl eligibility, which is something. It's meaningful this year because they lost their quarterback, Riley Leonard, for a good chunk of the season. They still managed to get to a bowl. Before that, he was AM's defensive coordinator for four seasons from 2018 through 2021. Before that, I know him. He's at Notre Dame. Yeah. I saw what he was able to do with the Notre Dame defense. So he's a guy who's, if you go back through his track record, he's succeeded at pretty much every level. He, he's a sharp guy. Um, one of the things that you've heard mentioned, uh, I think a lot, just in the immediate aftermath of this news now, I think becoming official, of course, there were um, uh, reports out there. There were posts uh, across social media, you name it. Um, with him getting off the plane and getting into the car and welcoming him to the Texas A&M family. There's a press conference to help celebrate Mike Elko, what have you. Um, one of the things that I know a lot of people are talking about is the fact that he's organized, that he's disciplined, that he's a no-nonsense coach. He's the type of guy that also resonates well with players, also resonates well with boosters. So if all of that is to be believed, that is a really good fit at a place like Texas A&M, which is not like every other place. Nope. Texas A&M is very nuanced. We talked about this before on the podcast. Texas A&M is a place where you've got a lot of outside influence. And so being able to herd those proverbial cats is definitely a skill that is required. Jimbo Fisher was not able to do that. Jimbo Fisher, um, at least for a moment in time, I think was the hot shot hire. He certainly ushered in this era of coaching contracts, as I think we've come to know them now. But at the end of the day, Jimbo Fisher... Um, fell out of favor because he couldn't adapt, I think, on the outside nor on the inside with his own system. And so hopefully Mike Elko sure. was able to to do a little bit of both and take, as you said, A&M to new heights. Yeah, it's it's an interesting hire. And look, obviously behind the scenes, Texas A&M said, look, we want an overachieving defensive coordinator turned head coach from the Jimbo tree who wears blue and white, right? Everybody w- was in agreement with that. And that that's Mark Stoops. That's Mike Elko. Um yeah, I, I think Jimbo's failings are probably much more on field than off field. I know there were stories about how he wasn't super fond of the glad handing circuit around the state of Texas and going to high school coaches conventions like other coaches in state did. But obviously he resonated enough early on, had the year in 2020 that I think gave a lot of people behind the scenes a ton of faith that that was just going to be the start when they go. I think it was nine and one yeah, uh, and are just outside of the playoff. Yeah. And then the recruiting class. Uh, subsequently, you know, sur- surely brings a ton of enthusiasm and optimism to the program, but just doesn't get it done on the field, doesn't make savvy hires, you know, has some quarterback bad luck, but, you know, the secondary this year was questionable. His ability to navigate close games against good teams, obviously pretty questionable, and it was clear that th- things weren't trending in the right direction. Mark Stoops, I think, is a fine hire. It does not get me all that excited. And I don't need a flashy name if I'm a Texas A&M fan. We talked about this before. We just want a good football coach. We just want a coach who is going to put his players, and I say we as in, like, the college football community who doesn't love nor hate Texas A&M, right? That what Texas A&M needed was somebody who was going to win close games, give his players the best ability to win those games, put them in the best position, and acquire the best possible talent in a place that it's easier than most, given the financial advantages and geographic advantages. And so I don't necessarily view Texas A&M as a sleeping giant, as you know, our friend Ari Wasserman likes to point out, but they certainly can succeed on a pretty high level with the right guy. And I would, if I were a Texas A&M fan, I'd be more thrilled with Mike Elko than Mark Stoops. Mark Stoops yeah. has fielded... I think one top 50 offense in the last six or seven years, that one Will Levis, Liam Cohen, Wandale Robinson year. It's important to me to see what a defensive-minded coach does on the opposite side of the ball, and they've had some absolute clunker offenses, and if offense has been the big issue these past few years at Texas A&M, that doesn't inspire me. That doesn't say Mark Stoops can find a system, has a vision for offense, has a vision for offensive coordinator that is different than where we've been. So... I like Mike Elko and the direction he's gone on offense and the offensive minds he's been associated with, uh, including at Texas A&M. Um, I guess that would be Jimbo, but um, you know, all over the place. I'm still, I'm still higher on uh, on Elko than Stoops. 
Yeah, I like the move. I think it's a smart hire. I was a little bit concerned on the A&M front that they would go for the shiniest possible car. Sure. Ryan Day, Dabo. We've got a lot of money. Dollars. Yeah. We've got a lot of money and a lot of egos to massage. That tends to be one of the byproducts. Yeah. And maybe that was part of how they got Jimbo in the first place. I don't know. I was a little concerned that they would make the move for the Dabo Sweeney, which sure. at this point I don't think is the right direction. No, to definitely not. So I like the move to get Elko. I think it is a smart hire. What what is, what is it that you like about Elko? Obviously, you talk about the success of you know bowl sure. eligibility, but you rooted for a team that briefly employed Mike Elko. You've watched Texas A and M defenses. You've watched Duke these past couple of years. You've you know seen Mike Elko out in the wild. What is it about this pairing that you know ceiling wise or rose colored glasses wise should have A and M fans excited? Well, two things. The first is I referenced it earlier, the organization, but. To win at a place like Duke, 16 and 9 in two years at Duke. Yep. To win at a place like that, that has historically been a very, very difficult job, requires you to get everybody on the same page. And Texas A&M has very much not been on the same page. I think that's been one of the failings for Jimbo on the field. It just feels like, feels like the team is somewhat disorganized. There are definitely aspects of that roster that are better than others. There is plenty of talent to go around. The fact that he could not get everybody swimming in the same direction, the fact that they did not have more success, I think speaks to coaching, and that's why they got rid of him. Mike Elko has not had that problem at Duke, different place, but he was able to upstart that, he was able to reboot that program very quickly. Right. And so that, in and of itself, I think is really exciting. Secondly, he got the most out of the talent he had on hand. It wasn't just an organization thing, it was a fundamental thing. He got that offense playing at, I think, all things considered, given the talent on hand, a pretty high level. He got that defense playing in a very fundamentally sound way. It didn't yeah. need to be sexy, but it was very efficient, and it was clear that he had an eye for player development. Yeah, and by the way, to, to piggyback on what you're saying, didn't hit the portal hard. No. That's not really an option at schools that you know, have academic bars to clear, like Duke and Stanford and Northwestern and Vanderbilt. Like, that's not really a dramatic option at a place like Duke. And so he he did it with the players he inherited, which is especially impressive. We, we will talk about this when we talk about Jonathan Smith here momentarily at Michigan State, but there's definitely a common thread, at least I think with the two most prominent hires so far this cycle, player development, keeping your roster, finding a way to get marginally better and turning in seasons that make you raise your eyebrows a little bit. Sure. Both of them have been very good at doing that in their span at Duke. We can talk about Jonathan Smith at Oregon State. So I think if you're an A&M fan, knowing all the, all the talent you've got on hand and the money that you've got on hand to try and bring in new talent, yeah. now you've got a guy in place who seemingly knows how to optimize that make it better, get it to its ceiling, that's exciting. That's what you want. Is exactly what you want. Now, the offense that you brought up, I think, is a concern. Sure. Right? What is What does this look like? This has been a defensive guy. He's obviously um, been able to win at Duke and yep. get the most out of his offensive talent on hand. I, I think his association with other bright offensive minds will become apparent. But, um, you know, that's something that we obviously need to see a little bit more of because Jimbo, for his part, was very rigid in his system. He never really moved the needle forward. So yeah. I want to see what Elko can do on that side of the ball. What he can do on defense is pretty well established at this point. Yep. And I think what he can do as a program builder just in two years at Duke is is pretty well established as well. Yeah, so he inherits a program that seemed to hit rock bottom under David Cutcliffe. And year one, they were points per drive-wise, which is, you know, my pet stat because it adjusts for tempo. Uh, 21st nationally uh, on offense, 42nd on defense the year before. In 2021, you know, the rock bottom year, that's 113th on offense, 119th on defense. Uh, Texas A&M does not have that type of uphill climb. Uh, it's a much tougher conference. You can get better quicker, I think, in the ACC. And you had mentioned the 2022 Duke schedule was especially advantageous. And, you know, they came right out and beat Clemson to start the year this year. And so to still have a pretty good Duke team this year making a bowl without... Riley Leonard for a large swath or a healthy Riley Leonard for a large swath of the season. Grayson I think. Loftus, an ultra Duke name. 
Yeah, absolutely. Backup quarterback. Yes. Um, so here's, I guess if there is concern on the other side of that coin, well, one is everybody seems to have in the modern era hit a very specific ceiling at Texas A&M, both in the Big 12 and SEC. Obviously, SEC lately has been more difficult to break through, but there has been that obvious ceiling and the the sort of term that either you said or were dancing around was alignment um that it's Mm -hmm. sometimes very difficult to win big if everybody behind the scenes isn't aligned pulling it in different directions and uh that's something that needs to be overcome there's a hurdle right there too um mike elko inherited riley leonard if memory serves okay so he has not gone out and found his quarterback of the future developed his quarterback of the future yet doesn't mean he can't doesn't mean he's not bringing riley leonard with him to college station at this time I haven't seen that story. I haven't seen any portal story of Riley Leonard following him to A&M. Uh, and three, there is something about... Okay, so Texas A&M hasn't technically... They're not at rock bottom as a program, right? It's I think it's easier to take over when you're like, okay, you've hit rock bottom. We're starting things completely different my way. Like he did at Duke, right? Like it was clear the David Cutcliffe era had come winding down and that was going to be it. And so Mike Elko comes into a situation where he was like, look... You guys haven't been winning a ton. It makes sense to start doing things a new way and using a new language. And here's the new practice schedule. And here's the new vision. Here are the new coaches, right? It was it was a great marriage for everybody involved, especially with Mike Elko's uh, history in the state and relationships in the state. Also has relationships and history in Texas. The other element of that is to start over at a power five place twice in essentially two years, right? I don't know what the actual calendar number of days it is. I think that's difficult. I think a lot of the coaches who succeed at big places, they're either internal and keeping success going. It's their first time. And so they have the most amount of energy that they're going to have. This is finally the debut of their vision. This is not the debut of Mike Elko's vision. That was at Duke. Doesn't mean he can't succeed at Texas A&M, but you're talking about scrapping everything, starting over, and then kind of scrapping everything, but you still want things working the way they were working if they were working but also starting over. So there's like this sort of gray area where you're not starting from scratch personally or as a program. And so can Mike Elko summon that balance to grow on what was working at Texas A&M and fully scrap and start over what wasn't working? And so whether that's recruiting, whether that's offense, whether that's culture behind the scenes, whether that's dealing with donors, whether that's dealing dealing with players inside the locker room and how things are going to operate, it's yet to be seen. I just think that's a tall task at a place no. as high profile as Texas A and M. The other thing that we should mention, yeah, he's going to have to re-recruit that roster. He's going to have to re-recruit, yeah. And I don't think that's going to be any picnic because no. the second that it became public knowledge that Jimbo is gone, all of the big Power Five programs that have money to spend in NIL, even those that don't, they were licking their chops. It is very rare you get a roster like this loaded to the teeth that is essentially on the open market. Right. We haven't seen that a whole lot. The NIL era is still relatively new, but this roster was built. Remember when it was put together, it was historic in mm-hmm. terms of recruiting classes. And a and has led the charge with respect to NIL. Which is why it might not be as dramatic uh, of a, a situation of players fleeing, right? Because sure. Texas a has the money, right? They if it's a negotiation thing... And Mike Elko really wants a player to stay, and there's an offer from Alabama or Oregon or Ohio State or whoever. I don't think they're going to lose out because of money. They're that's, not going to lose that's out because of money. Yeah. They're not going to lose out because of money. But if you're Evan Stewart, if you're a guy like a Connor Wegman, if, sure. you know, I could list names on the offense. But if you're a guy like that, maybe not knowing the specific offensive vision causes you to start looking elsewhere, dipping your toes in, in uh, yeah, other fresh waters. Start. Yep. And that's where I think things could get interesting. So we'll see what Elko can do. I, I like the hire. I think it was a smart hire. I'm glad they didn't go for the shiniest possible object. Yeah. You get a guy with a lot of familiarity within the program. Somebody who's been around college football has got a good wealth of experience. And um, I credit Ross Bjork. Maybe they tried for Mark Stoops and it didn't sure. work, but ultimately you end up with a guy who I think is a pretty good coach. By the way, so, also the good news here is everybody seems to like Mike Elko. Yeah. Everybody who comes across, maybe not current Duke players, understandably so. But beyond that, I think they 
it seemed like the proof was they really enjoyed playing and developing under Mike Elko and his staff at Duke. Everybody who's come across Mike Elko says he's just a sharp dude who people get along with. And you know what? That kind of goes a long way when you're recruiting at a huge place, when you're building out, you know, a staff, a roster, re-recruiting a roster, as you mentioned, like his reputation is pretty high up there, both as a football mind and as a human. So that's a terrific place to start and feel optimism about if you're an A&M fan.